Grab yourself a coffee and pull up a seat because today I'm teaching you how to play the expansion for the Night Cage entitled Shrieking Hollow from Smirk and Dagger Games. I'm Mark Maya and this is Board Game Coffee. You awake in the dark with nothing but a candle. And wait, have you done this before? The deja vu is less troubling than the change it implies. Was the ground always this unstable around you? When the tunnels crumbled into the pits, did they always scream? And why does it feel like those screams are getting closer? In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules for the one to five player cooperative expansion to The Night Cage, entitled Shrieking Hollow. To play Shrieking Hollow, you'll need to know the rules for the base game of The Night Cage, which I won't be teaching in this video. Although I will briefly go over some of the basic rules for those of you who have played and just need a little refresher. If you don't know how to play the base game, I've included links in the description that will lead you to other channels that have created how to play and playthrough videos for The Night Cage. So if you want, you can go watch those first, then come back here. I'll wait. Welcome back. Now, if I haven't mentioned this before, you should know that to play Shrieking Hollow, you'll need the ugh, base game of The Night Cage, which is sold separately. For this how to play video, I'll be focusing on the rules for a four player game, but I'll be sure to point out the differences for those of you playing a five player game. Now, before we get started, let's take a look at what Shrieking Hollow brings to the table. If you've ever played the Night Cage base game, then you're off to a good start, because the core rules for the most part are still the same. However, there have been some additions which will drastically change your experience, and others that oh, won't change much at all. The setup, for example. Except for the addition of a few new boards and tiles, not much has changed. On the flip side of that, pits now play a crucial role in your gameplay experience, and will drop you into this hole of horrors which comes fully stocked with its own living nightmare known as the Other. I, I see that thing whenever I close my eyes. <coughs> Throughout the game, the Other will try to make its way out of the hollow and onto the main board, where it will hunt down players and destroy tiles before returning to the hellhole from once it came. Now, there are additional monsters and this Night Terror deck that will be unlocked as stretch goals during the Kickstarter campaign that I won't be covering in this video, so you'll want to check out the rules for those once you got your hands on them. Much of the setup for Shrieking Hollow is the same as the base game, so I'll be focusing on the new additional steps that you'll need to take. First, place the hollow board alongside the main board. Then take the three sections that make up the other and place them here at the bottom of the hollow board. Next, place the new discard board next to the base game's discard board. Take all the passage tiles from the base game, the 13 cracked tiles from the Shrieking Hollow expansion, and mix them all together face down. Then randomly select 10 of those tiles and set them aside for now. We'll need them again in a little bit. Now add in 12 wax eater tiles and mix them in. Once that's done, create four stacks roughly the same size, making sure that all tiles are flipped pit side up. Then gather up four gate tiles, seven key tiles, and six shriek tiles from the Shrieking Hollow expansion. In front of each stack, place one gate tile, one key tile, one shriek tile, and flip them face down. Now take the remaining tiles, shuffle them together, and deal one in front of each stack. The last remaining tile can be placed in front of either of the two center stacks. In a five player game, your tile distribution will always look like this. So you can just follow the layout on the screen. All right, back to our four player stack. Once you have your gate, 
key and shriek tiles distributed according to your player count, mix them into their corresponding stack. Now place each stack on top of one another inside the cardboard candle in this order. Stack number one, stack number two, stack number three, and lastly, stack number four. Then take the 10 tiles that we set aside earlier and place them on top. Now your draw stack is ready to go. As far as the player setup goes, nothing has changed from the base game, including the fact that you'll still need to play with all four prisoners when playing with less than five players. So even in a solo game, one player will control all four prisoners. You'll only add the fifth prisoner when playing a game with five players. Although we're learning to play an all new expansion, much of how the game plays is still the same. So it'll be familiar for those of you who have played the base game. That said, I will be going over a few core mechanics from the Night Cage. Now, I won't be going over every rule and the, the ones I do will be brief. If you're all brushed up on the rules for the base game, then feel free to skip ahead to the what's changed portion of this video using the index in the description below. Now, the main thing to remember is that players are playing as prisoners walking around an ever-changing maze in the pitch black with nothing more than a single candle to light their way. And the glow of that candle is only strong enough to light up adjacent tiles. If a space has a tile on it, that space is considered lit. When there is no tile on it, it's considered unlit. Whenever you need to place a tile or discard a tile, take the top tile from the draw stack and place it where needed according to the base game rules. For the first round of the game, each player will take turns placing their starting tile and prisoner anywhere on the main board and lighting up both adjacent spaces connected by passages. On your turn, you can move your prisoner one space along a passage. Once you stop, light up any adjacent spaces connected by passageways and remove the tiles that are beyond the glow of your candle. Remember, the main board wraps around, both horizontally and vertically, which means these spaces are adjacent to one another. So I can move a prisoner from here to here. This will also illuminate the adjacent tiles on the other side of the board. The passages in the night cage are too small to fit more than one prisoner. So you can't share a tile with another prisoner or move through a tile with another prisoner on it. The only exception to this rule is the gate tile. It's big enough to hold all prisoners and wide enough to let prisoners pass through it while occupied. If you walk off one of these cracked tiles, it immediately flips over, leaving a pit in its place. The same thing will happen if you decide not to move on your turn and remain standing on the cracked tile. If you're on the tile when it forms a pit, or simply walk into a pit, you'll end up in the hollow. Now the falling into the hollow part is new to the Shrieking Hollow expansion, so I'll be covering that in more detail later in the video. If you get hit by a monster, you immediately go lights out and discard three tiles from the stack. When your lights out, you don't light up the tiles adjacent to you, and you can only see the tile you're standing on. In addition, when moving, you must blindly choose a space to move to and place a single tile there. When your lights out, you're always moving. The only way to not move is to spend a nerve token. And remember, you can't gain nerve tokens while your lights out. As soon as a prisoner who is lights out is adjacent to another prisoner who is not, their candle will be lit once again. At this point, light up the appropriate tiles. These are nerve tiles. If your candle is lit and you decide to stay on your current tile and not move this turn, you will earn one nerve tile. Prisoners can hold up to two nerve tiles at a time. And what those nerve tiles do is explained here on your prisoner status card. When your draw stack is empty, the final flicker is triggered. 
At the end of each prisoner's turn, once the final flicker has been triggered, remove any one lit tile from the board. To win the game, each prisoner must be holding one key and standing on the same gate tile at the same time to escape the night cage. All right, now that we've reviewed a few of the core game basics, let's take a look at what's new. A lot of it involves pits, falling into this big hole, running in terror from this thing, and these shriek tiles, which always seem to turn up at the worst possible time. That said, let's start by entering the hollow. In the base game of The Night Cage, falling into a pit would place you on the outskirts of the board until your next turn. At worst, it was an inconvenience. This time around, whenever you fall into a pit, your prisoner ends up in the hollow. That's this second board over here. And not only is this board a another place to explore, it's also home to the terror known as the other. Okay, here's how it works. When a prisoner falls or jumps into a pit, they are placed in the lowest unoccupied row of the hollow on a space with no tile on it. Once there, draw and place tiles as you normally would. One underneath your prisoner, and one on any adjacent space illuminated by their candle. Unless your light's out, in which case you would only light up the tile you're standing on. When moving or illuminating adjacent tiles in the hollow, keep in mind that the board wraps around horizontally along the grid, but not vertically, which means this space is adjacent to this space, and vice versa. But no space down here is adjacent to any space on the top row. Let's run through an example of entering the hollow. If the yellow prisoner entered the hollow, they would first determine which is the lowest unoccupied row. And since red is occupying this row here, the next lowest row, which is unoccupied, would be this one. Next, yellow would place their prisoner in one of the unlit spaces in that row, meaning a space with no tile on it. Now, if this was the situation and the purple prisoner fell into the hollow, they would be placed in this row here, between the red and yellow prisoner, because this is the lowest unoccupied row in the hollow. Walking around in the hollow works pretty much the same as walking around on the main board. Players move one space, illuminate adjacent tiles, and remove the tiles that are out of range of their candlelight. Monsters, keys, and gates are placed in the hollow as they would be on the main board, and crumble in the same way. The only tiles that won't be placed in the hollow are these shriek tiles, but I'll be talking about those later in the video. Before we go, I'd like to mention that jumping into the hollow voluntarily isn't necessarily a bad idea, because a prisoner in the hollow with a lit candle will actually prevent the other from moving, which is a great way to keep it in the hollow and not wreaking havoc across the main board. Okay, so now that you're in the hollow, how do you get out? Well, you can either leave by choice or you can be forced out. There are a few options for both, but let's start with the ways you can leave the hollow by choice, and then we'll move on to the more forceful methods. There are three ways in which the prisoners can leave the hollow by choice. First and most obvious is to climb your way out by moving your prisoner past the top row of the hollow. The second way is to fall into a pit, because falling into a pit while it's in the hollow will drop you back on the main board. And the third way you can leave the hollow by choice is by walking onto one of these key tiles. Doing so will earn you a key, flip the key tile to its pit side, and drop you on the main board. The catch is, if the prisoner already has a key, they don't get another one, but the tile is still flipped to its pit side and the prisoner is still dropped on the main board. Mind you, if you have the foresight to do so, you can always pass your key off to another adjacent prisoner who doesn't have a key of their own before you step onto the key tile. All right, now let's learn about all the ways you can get forced out of the hollow. If the other ever passes over a prisoner like so, the prisoner is considered smothered, 
When a prisoner is smothered in the hollow, they go lights out, take a three tile penalty, and are ejected back to the main board. If a prisoner moves onto a key tile on the main board, not only do they collect a key, assuming they don't already have one, but all the prisoners currently in the hollow will be automatically ejected to the main board with their candles lit, and without taking any tile penalties. The last way to get forced out of the hollow is by drawing three shriek tiles. When that happens, the other moves up the hollow, ignoring all lit candles. Any prisoner that was smothered in the process goes lights out, gets penalized three tiles, and is ejected to the main board, as mentioned earlier. Any remaining prisoners in the hollow also get ejected, but do not suffer any penalties, and their candles stay lit. I'll be covering how and when the other moves in just a little bit. Okay, so we've covered how to get out of the hollow, but what happens after that? Where do we go? When exiting the hollow, either by force or by choice, select any unlit space on the main board to place your prisoner. Draw and place a tile under your prisoner and illuminate any adjacent tiles connected by passages. If your prisoner is lights out, then don't illuminate any additional spaces. Either way, this ends your movement. The other is a creature made up of three sections. Each section is four tiles wide and two tiles high. The other's goal is to escape the hollow and wreak havoc on the main board, destroying tiles and smothering prisoners. Depending on where the other is located, either in the hollow or on the main board, changes how the other is activated. While the other is in the hollow, it will move when one or more pits are formed on the main board during your turn. The only exception to this is your starting tile. Flipping your starting tile to its pit side will not activate the other. And just to clarify, only pits formed on the main board will cause the other to move while it's in the hollow. Any pits formed in the hollow will have no effect on the other. I'd also like to clarify that no matter how many pits are formed during your turn, the other will only move once. Whenever the other is activated, it moves forward two spaces at a time. Let's run through a quick example. Let's say the blue player has moved off this crumbling tile, forming a pit on the main board. Once that happens, the other will move forward two spaces up the hollow. Any tiles it covers while moving are removed. And if it passes over a lights out prisoner in the process, that prisoner is considered smothered which means it suffers a three tile penalty and is ejected to the main board. Now, the reason I specifically called out a prisoner that was lights out is because if even one prisoner in the hollow has a lit candle when the other activates, the other doesn't move at all because it's held back by the glow of the candle. Night lights, man, I'm telling you, they work. Each time you move the other, add one of its boards to the hollow connecting each piece to the back of the one that came before it. It'll look something like this. First move, one board. Second move, two boards. Third move, three boards. Once the other is at its full length, as we see here, it'll stop exactly one row from the top of the hollow. From this position, the next time the other activates, it'll move from the hollow to the main board. Now, before we get into what the other does while it's on the main board, there's a couple of rules I'd like to clear up. Firstly, since this is the highest the other will ever travel up the hollow, any prisoner standing on the top row will always be out of the other's reach, and therefore cannot be smothered. If a prisoner falls into the hollow at the same time the other leaves the hollow, they do not encounter each other. Therefore, the prisoner falls to the lowest level of the hollow, 
as explained in the Entering the Hollow section that we covered earlier in the video. And since the Other and the Prisoner never encountered each other, the Prisoner's Candle stays lit. When the Other leaves the Hollow, place it so that the head section rests on the edge of the main board, overlapping four spaces. You also need to make sure that its line of sight intersects with the next prisoner in turn order that is currently on the main board. So if this was the next player in turn order, we could place the other here, here, or maybe here. There are a lot of options when it comes to placing the other, so choose wisely. In a five-player game, the only difference is that the other is placed just off the edge of the grid rather than overlapping any spaces. While on the main board, the other's movement is no longer triggered by the formation of pits, and your candles do nothing to stop it. At the end of each subsequent turn, after it was placed on the board, the other will move two spaces in the direction it's facing, so you'll want to get out of its way as soon as possible. In a four-player game, since the other starts with its head already on the grid, you would add an additional section to its body every time it moved. If you're playing a five-player game, the other starts off the grid, which means for the first move, all you'll be placing is the head, and you won't be adding any additional sections until after it's made its first move. As the other moves across the main board, it'll more than likely pass over an illuminated tile or two. At this point, do not remove any tiles that it covers. That'll be handled later, and when we get to it, you'll understand why. Any prisoners the other passes over as it moves along the main board are instantly smothered. They go lights out, suffer a three tile penalty, and are dropped into the hollow. If all three sections of the other are on the main board when it comes time to move, it leaves the main board and returns to the hollow. Any tiles that the other passed over that are no longer illuminated are removed from the board, and any tiles that are still illuminated are flipped over to their pit side to illustrate the damage caused by the other. The exception to this is the shriek tiles. If a shriek tile was run over by the other, it remains face up. Do not flip it to its pit side. These are shriek tiles, and this is what they do. When a shriek tile is drawn on the main board, place it like you would any other tile. This is when things start to go bad. Once placed, a shriek tile is always illuminated meaning no matter how far a prisoner gets from it, the shriek tile will always remain illuminated. The idea being that their constant shrieking makes it hard to lose track of them in the dark. On their own, shriek tiles act as obstacles that the prisoners will have to maneuver around. They can't be stepped on or passed through in any way. Although the shriek tiles act as obstacles for prisoners getting around the board, they do not block line of sight for monsters or get in the way of their attacks. If you're ever asked to discard a tile and it turns out to be a shriek tile, or if the shriek tile is drawn while you're in the hollow, place it onto the main board connected to any open passage, because shriek tiles are never placed in the hollow. Once the shriek tile has been placed on the main board, you can return to illuminating the spaces you were trying to illuminate before it appeared. Now, Here's the thing, one or two shriek tiles, not a big problem, I, I can handle one or two. It's when the third one shows up that the shriek really hits the fan. After the third shriek tile is drawn, discard it immediately. Then flip over the other two shriek tiles to their pit side. Once flipped, if either of these tiles is not illuminated by a prisoner's candle, remove it from the board. After the third shriek tile is drawn and you've discarded or flipped the necessary tiles, the other immediately advances two spaces. This is referred to as calling to the other. When the other moves as a result of the calling, follow all the same movement rules we covered earlier, with one exception. If the other is in the hollow when this happens, it will ignore all candlelight, which means nothing can hold it back.
In addition, any prisoners that are in the hollow that are not smothered when the other advances are also ejected to the main board, although those prisoners do not go lights out or suffer any penalties. This calling to the other movement is in addition to any other movement that might happen on that turn. So if the other is on the main board, it would still advance at the end of the turn as normal, meaning it would advance twice in one turn, which is never good. Now, if you can survive all that, collect a key for each prisoner and get to a gate tile, you win. Easy peasy. Before I go, I'd like to say again, if you haven't played the, the original Night Cage or need a refresher, make sure to watch the videos I linked in the description to learn how to play that before you dive into this. And that's it. I hope this video helps, and I hope you enjoy playing the Night Cage Shrieking Hollow. See you next week. Thanks for joining us. If you like this video and want to see more, subscribe to our channel. It's the best way to keep up to date with everything we do here at Board Game Coffee. But if you want to see more right now, we got plenty of videos to choose from. And if that's not enough, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Mark Maya, and this is Board Game Coffee. And remember, have fun, keep gaming, be social. See you next week.